Hi friends! In this video, I'm gonna talk about all things ghost hunting with the one and only Kenny Biddle, a real life paranormal investigator as we stay overnight in a real haunted house. How cool is that? The mysterious Hinsdale House in the mountains of Western New York is rumored to be a hotbed of paranormal activity. And it's not just the house. Legends around the house include a hanging tree, a fatal pond, and forested hills rumored to be filled with graves. The house gained notoriety in the 70s when the residents, the dandies, experienced frequent and even menacing poltergeist-like activity, which persisted even after a priest performed an exorcism on the house. Some believe the hauntings trace back to a Native American massacre in 1799 and from a pair of brothers in the 1800s who robbed and murdered stagecoach passengers and buried them in the cellar in the surrounding hills. Very creepy. Today, the house is a magnet for ghost hunters and paranormal enthusiasts. I stayed in the Hinsdale house overnight with Kenny Biddle, who's not only the world's only full-time paranormal investigator, he used to be a ghost hunter. I was curious, how is a paranormal investigation different than a ghost hunt? And how does a scientific skeptic think about the supernatural? So we grabbed a drink and sat down for a fun chat. Enjoy. I'm sitting in a haunted house, the Hinsdale house, with the one and only Kenny Biddle, who is the world's only full-time paranormal investigator. Yes. Can you tell me what that is? No. <laughs> uh, yeah, so basically, uh, I, I, my official title is the Chief Investigator for the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry. And I am the full-time employee that deals with extraordinary claims that are more on the paranormal slant. So anything that has to do with ghosts or demons or aliens, UFOs, monsters, cryptids, Bigfoot, religious mysteries. Um, just witches? Witches. I mean, any kind of things like that. Uh, but it also spills over into other things like uh, homeopathy um, and facilitated communication, stuff like that. Um, medical myths or, or alt medicine that really isn't medicine. And I help investigate uh, the, the alleged claims and examples so that I can show that it doesn't really work. Um, but I also want to point out that my goal is not to debunk everything. My goal is to investigate and find the truth. So whatever that might be is what it is. And I let the data follow to a conclusion. That's how I go. Okay. So do you think we're going to find a ghost tonight? I doubt it. Uh, and, and I know that's probably cliche coming from a professional skeptic, but I, I, I doubt it because I've been here. I've been to this location uh, three times already, and I haven't seen anything that would warrant me to, to believe that there's something weird going on. Um, although there are plenty of claims, there's lots of claims out there, hundreds even, from people that have stayed here. We're actually sitting on a couch Yes. that is supposedly the place where, what, what happened here? So back in the 70s, uh, I believe there was a priest that came in here and could not get official sanction to do a, an exorcism. But instead, uh, I, I think he did a workaround and did a house cleansing. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what that means. I haven't actually seen the records of this, so I don't know what really happened. But apparently this is where the exorcism was performed. Or this area. And not this couch, because this is not the original couch that was here. This is uh, something that was brought in afterwards. But this is the area. That's why we're sitting here. Because apparently, you know, if anything's going to happen, it's going to be here. And on the record, you're going to sleep here tonight. Yes. Yeah, I'm going to okay. sleep on the, on the couch. So we'll check back in in the morning. Yeah, you know, make sure I'm still breathing. Or here. I mean, maybe I'll be possessed. Maybe. You know, How will we know the difference? Well, I mean, you know, what's interesting is they have uh, uh, security cameras around here. And there's mm. one upstairs. So, I mean, it, maybe I'll be that weird guy or weird uh, person in paranormal activity that just stands there for like six hours and stares at you people. <laughs> okay, if I wake up and you're staring at me, I'm never staying at your house again. Okay, good it's to know. creep me off. Good to know. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, totally I have an out now. reasons. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how, um, you're not a ghost hunter, but no. you used to be a yes. ghost hunter. Can you tell me about that? So, back in, like, starting in 1997, I got married, 
and it was a, as a wedding gift to ourselves. We bought a personal computer. Oh. And this was ninety seven. The nineties. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> the internet was brand new. It, it was the World Wide Web. Um, the dial-up modem. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> AOL. I can um, hear it clear. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that that was my first experience. Uh, my first. Uh, I, well, I grew up watching like shows like In Search of and Unsolved Mysteries, um, sightings, stuff like that, and I loved it. Absolutely loved it. I grew up in a Catholic household, so I wasn't. Ghosts were not a thing. Unless it had to do with religion. <laughs> so, like, the Holy Ghost was allowed, but ghosts of people were not talked about. Okay, so I, I interrupted you. Apologies for that. But, um, so, you grew up Catholic, which means that you grew up believing in, in ghosts? I did. I, I, I had my own belief. I, it wasn't taught to me. Um, I just thought it was fascinating. I watched those TV shows. The library at our at my Catholic school had... I think two books that were about ghosts. And I, I remember the cover of one had the Brown Lady of Raymond Hall, which is mm -hmm. arguably the one of the most famous ghost photos ever. And I read that book every day, every time. With the, that's the only two books I, I took out was the mm -hmm. one on paranormal stuff. Um, so I always had an interest in it. When we got, when I, I got married, we got our computer. One of the first things I looked up was ghosts. And I found that there were ghost hunting groups all around the country. And I was like, wow, this is cool. People can do this. Didn't need a certification. Didn't need any training. You just joined a group and you went out and you were a ghost hunter. And uh, I mean, that still holds true today. <laughs> you don't need any kind of training. You just decide, I'm going to be a ghost hunter and you are. So that's what I did. And for a while, I was going with the beliefs of like mists and weird strange lights balls of light which are commonly known as orbs which are the bane of my existence anymore um but all of these things caught on film because it's still we're talking about the 90s so most people that i knew still used film mm -hmm. 35 millimeter cameras that were compact so flash was really close to the lens you got anom anomalies uh then digital cameras came along and they weren't perfect they were very low resolution they were horrible People still got anomalies, <laughs> just foster. It, it just grew. Um, and I was going along with it. And uh, it was in, not until a few years after I started doing that that I had an experience in Gettysburg that changed my way of thinking. And I, I, I started realizing I was doing a lot of things wrong. Um, and then I came over to the more oh, skeptical side. Do say more. Do say more. So I'll try to keep it brief because it's, it's kind of a long story, but... In Gettysburg for a paranormal conference, and we were out at this secret spot on the battlefield that we had, were told by one of the rangers was very haunted. The rangers wouldn't go there, so we were of course excited about it because you know exclusive rights and, and uh, ghost hunters back then really territorial. You you just you had your spot you didn't share. Oh. Nobody shared information. You could talk about your cases. But you wouldn't tell anyone exactly where it was because you didn't want somebody else coming in. That is steam. not scientific. Not at all. Okay. Not at all. <laughs> um, there was no sharing. There was no... Uh, you could be friendly, but it was always that friendly competition. Mm -hmm. Everyone wanted a TV pilot. Everyone oh, wanted to be on TV. Everybody okay. wanted a book. Um, so, uh, so we're out there one night, and uh, my little group, there was only like five or six of us were in this little patch of woods, uh, by the wheat field, and I look past the tree line. So we're in a patch of woods, and then next to us, the tree line stops because it's a tree line. So, yeah, uh, and there's an open field, and it's called the wheat field. So across that wheat field, I see a, a few cars, three cars coming down the road. They pull over, and they people get out, and I start seeing flashlights. I see laser pointers because back then, a infrared temperature gun was a hot, hot item to have for a ghost hunting team, and most of them came with laser pointers. So, okay. because ghost hunters are big kids, they played with the laser pointers all over the place. Uh, so I saw them, and they're making noise, and they're walking out into the field. And I was starting to get annoyed because they were getting loud, and they were starting to get closer. Then I noticed they were coming straight at us. And the closer they got, the more angry I got. Eventually, I walked out of the woods, and I screamed at them to shut up, go away. 
get out of here. This is our spot. Go away. They turned around, ran back to their cars, drove away. Next morning, get up, go down to the conference, and we start mingling. We hear a group of people talking about how they saw an apparition the night before. And I know everybody watching, <laughs> you know where this is going. So we start talking, asking questions, and they start talking about they were in the wheat field. They got there. They saw an apparition come out of the woods. And I was like, I was there. You know, what, what time? They told us what time. That's when we were there. I'm like, oh, we came to the, uh, we, we saw this figure. It was a big figure. And I was like, where? At the edge. And they described exactly where we were. I was like, that was us. And it clicked. Like, they saw me. Uh -huh. That was, This is the group that I yelled at. Uh-huh. And I, I started describing. I'm like, well, it was a big guy. My my height came out of the woods, said this to you. And they're like, well, yeah, yeah. I was like, that was me. And they said, no, it wasn't you. It was an apparition. I said, no, I just told you what was going on. And I described, like, you had three cars. You had laser pointers. You had flashlights. There were, I think there were, like, seven or eight or nine of you. There were a bunch of you and whatever, because this is years ago, so... But I described everything, and they're like, well, no, no, it, it couldn't have been you. We know what we're doing. And I was like, yeah, okay. And one of them actually told me, stop stealing our spotlight. Like, you just trying to steal our spotlight. Stop it. And that was it. I, I stopped talking to them. They walked away. And that really started me thinking, what am I doing? Like, this is, they are me. I am them. We do the same thing. But here I am giving them all the information. I'm describing exactly what happened, and they're ignoring me. They're ignoring the information and sticking with what they believe. And I think that that hit the, the, the switch. They had started to spark the fire. It did everything in my head and said, you're doing shit wrong. <laughs> and that's when I started getting into more of the skeptical literature. I found people like Ben Rafford and Joe Nickel who was writing for Skeptical Inquirer, which I write for now, um, and their investigations and realizing like how much I was doing wrong. I was saying that I was investigating ghosts, and I wasn't. I was not. I was chasing ghost stories and indulging in them and repeating them and basically carrying on the, the tradition of the, the ghost story without actually investigating I was hunting ghosts because I, I was hunting anomalies. That's what I was doing. What I didn't understand, I said was a ghost. What I didn't realize what was happening, if I saw an anomaly in a photo, instead of trying to explain it, I explained it by a ghost. Yeah. So that really hit me hard, and it really made me... Uh, I was angry at first, and I, I really angry turned... At angry at myself for being so wrong because I was going into people's uh, houses and and investigating again I'm liberal use of air quotes here <laughs> because I wasn't investigating I was waiting for something to happen ghost hunts are not investigations as a whole they are stakeouts because you're not investigating a mystery you're like when we come here we're in this haunted house and for the most part ghost hunters will come in here and sit and wait for something to happen can you explain um, what um, searching for anomalies means? So, if you're if you are looking at a photograph or a video or you're listening to audio, you are searching for something that you don't think fits. It's an anomaly. It's something that doesn't fit with the norm. So, if I take a picture of this living room, I see everything that's in here, and if there happens to be some kind of blurred light streak on it. That's an anomaly because I didn't see it there. I didn't see it when I took the picture, yet here it is on film or on digital. So what is it? I'm not sure. I mean, now most of the time I'm, I, I'm pretty sure what it is, but that is still an anomaly. If you're listening to an audio recording in a, a room, like you put a digital recorder down, you left it there for an hour, you came back, allegedly no one's in the house, but you hear something that sounds like a voice. That's an anomaly because it's something that's out of the ordinary. It's not normal. It shouldn't be there. And instead of trying to investigate what caused that, instead of trying to recreate the situation and maybe see what in this room might make that noise, it's often 
uh, taken right away as this is proof of, of an afterlife. This is proof of spirit activity or ghost or something like that. So it's something out of the ordinary, something I can't explain. Yes. So it must be supernatural. Yes. If you could talk to yourself like 30 years ago, 25 years ago, what would you say? <laughs> 30 years ago. Well, first, stop it. <laughs> just stop it. Um, and, and just say educate. You know, go read a book that's not by a ghost hunter. That's not by a, a storyteller. Because one of the, the big things that influenced me in my ghost hunting days was I read a lot of regional ghost story books. Mm. And they were just by ghosts. They were by storytellers, mm -hmm. authors, not people that investigated it, nothing to do with science. They were just storytellers. And I read those and I took those at face value. So it was, it was difficult to break away from that. Um, and when I eventually did, uh, now I start seeing the, the transition that I was wrong. I was doing things wrong. I wasn't paying attention. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't, I wasn't, learning about science even though I was saying I was being scientific mm. and the reason I said I was being scientific was mm. because I was using gadgets mm. technology meant science to mm. me and that's what I grew up on like that's what I saw in these these tv shows and stuff like they were using these little gadgets and taking readings and even though I didn't understand how they worked I still used them and then when the the ghost hunting reality shows came along and they really, they, they, they promoted using gadgets mm. on every episode. It was part of it. You, you weren't a ghost hunting team unless you had uh, an EMF meter, a temperature gun. Um, you needed motion sensors. You need cameras. You need all this stuff. So that's what I was getting. Like, let's get this. And now I'm scientific. I'm not realizing. <laughs> I, was, I was far from being scientific. So basically, those were all just tools to enable you to find more anomalies. Yes. As opposed to actually trying to investigate. So, so let me, uh, yeah. So, yes, because I was using these tools without understanding how to use them mm. or how to interpret the results. I had no idea. I was taking everything from TV. I was taking everything from the ghost story books that I was reading. Kenny in the olden days versus Kenny now. Let's say that you come in to investigate in the Hinsdale house. Okay. What's the difference in methodology that you would use? So, the older days, um, I would probably come in here. I would set up a camera in the corner with me in view. Uh, and then I would sit on a, on a couch or a chair and I would have an audio recorder, usually a micro cassette recorder, because this was the old days. Okay. Um, or a full cassette recorder. And what would you use today? Uh, probably a, a phone? A, 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 yeah, I would use my phone. Okay. Um, or any digital recorder. I have, I have okay. several. Um, but you're, you're taking audio and video? Video, yeah. Okay. And I would have my camera, and usually a 35 millimeter, next to me. And I would ask questions. So, to oh. the dark, I would say, like... Is anybody here? You pause for like 10 seconds. What's your name? How old are you? How did you die? You ask all these questions, assuming that there is some kind of spirit here that can talk back to you. And you ask these questions, and after a certain amount of time, you stop the, the audio recorder, and you play it back. And you listen to see if anything answered you. Okay. Or any kind of noise comes up. Um, and that's basically what I would do. And usually I got nothing. But I kept going. Um, mm -hmm. uh, an alternative, alternative method to that would be to do the same thing, except I would leave the room. So the video camera would be going, the audio recorder would be going, and I would leave the room for a while and go somewhere else. And then I would come back and replay it and see if there was something on there. Um, some kind of voice or a noise. And... Again, it was anomaly hunting because it didn't matter what the noise was. If there was a noise, that was something. It was confirmation. Yes, that there was something going on in this room when nobody was here. Something paranormal. Yes. Yes, okay. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and if I was in the room, I'd have my camera with me, I would take random pictures. 
Okay. Just you know, if I if I thought I, if I heard a floor creak or something back behind me, I would bring the camera up, take a picture behind me. Uh, if if somebody said, "Oh, I got a chill," take a picture mm. because ghosts, you know, because they're dead, they're cold. <laughs> I guess you know, and, okay. and if you feel a chill, that that is supposed to mean that there's a spirit around you. Okay. Uh, so you would take a picture of that person, and then. Again, in the old days, you would take it to the drugstore, wait a few days, and get film back, and then you would go through. Like, oh, cool, let's see what I got. Did you, in in the olden days, think you ever found anything? Yeah. You yeah. did? Yeah. Uh, before I knew what um, dust particles did with, with the, the light of the flash, before I knew what lens flare was, um, before I knew what light leak was. What is light leak? light leak? Light leak is when you're using a film camera and the back panel flexes and light gets in. Um, because you, once you enclose the film in, in the camera, it's, it's light tight. No light can get in, okay. except when you hit the button and the shutter opens. Um, but oh. if you flex, especially with plastic cameras, yeah. much easier to do. Because sometimes they warp, or if you're holding it too tight, like if you get scared yeah. or something and you twist it, the back panel will lift off just enough uh -huh. and let just a little bit of light in. And when that does, it gets onto the film and it mm. creates this light leak. Sometimes it looks like a streak. Sometimes it looks like almost like a pyramid um, where the point of light came in and kind of shined in. And it just ruins the, the Do image. digital cameras ever do this? You don't get light leak on digital cameras because it's all on the sensor. Okay. Um, there's no film... Because uh, the the shutter you have the shutter in the lens, but then you also have the mirror in front of the the sensor, um, so there, it, there's enough to block it. There's no film involved. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, so yeah, I would I would wait, see them when the film came back, see if there was any anomalies on it, and that that included orbs, or even mists, like any kind of misty things if you're outside, mm -hmm. and at a cemetery because that was a common place you go, if you got a mist, which. How could a mist show up at like one o'clock in the morning <laughs> on a nice night, nice cool night? Because um, that's what happened. Mm. Uh, then it would show up because the flash would go off and it would light it up and you would the smoky little mm. weird thing. And it was like, all right, I got an anomaly. That was called ecto. Okay. And that's something, that's a whole other topic we can get into, ectoplasm and okay. the evolution of that. So we have orbs and ectoplasm and um, EMF. EMF. Um, but I guess um, I guess I have a bigger question here. So, Kenny in the olden days thought he found ghosts. Um, has Kenny, as an investigator, it's so weird how you're using my name. I know. It's, uh, like, <laughs> I'm like, who are you talking about? <laughs> Is that me? <laughs> okay. Um, ha has Kenny, the investigator, ever found a ghost? No, I have not. Uh, Bigfoot? I've, I have Aliens? not found both. No. Have you found any? I haven't paranormal? found anything that I would consider paranormal. Uh, I still look. I want to make that clear. I, I keep looking because I hope to find something. I really do. I'm not that skeptic that dismisses everything. I really want to find a ghost. I want to find Bigfoot. I want to find an alien because I really want to drive their spacecraft. <laughs> Um, good. That's the first thing. I'll be like, look, you know, I know, I know what's going to happen, <laughs> but as compensation, I want to drive. Okay. <laughs> just, That's just a fair. little bit. I'm just a little one lap around the moon, okay. you know, and I'm, I'm good. You know, <laughs> we call it even. Uh, but I have not found, uh, I haven't found solid evidence and I haven't found anything that would hint, um, at any of these things. Uh, because there's, there's so much... I, I think it really comes down to lack of information. What do you mean? Because when someone has an experience, they're, they're usually not paying attention to what they're doing. It happens so quick. Mm -hmm. um, it happens within seconds, and they don't get a good description of what they saw. Mm -hmm. Because they have a story, and, and we've heard it. We've heard it a couple times. Um, and, you know, as we've gone through some of the investigations, and even today, we've heard a lot of stories. There's assumptions there's generalizations um but when you start asking clarifying questions mm -hmm. the story falls apart there's missing information when you ask uh it's like a common thing that i say or, or a common anal analogy that i use is that 
when people say that they saw, saw an apparition wearing period dress. And I'm always like, okay, what, what period? Mm. You know, like, that's a big question. What period? What are we talking about? Period dress to me doesn't mean anything. It just means... Days of your Something. Yeah, days of your <laughs> <laughs> That's got to be a book or a video or something. I'm going to do like a, a comedy video that's just a days of your and just have nonsense for an hour. Um, but yeah, like, tell me more. Tell me what they were actually wearing. Was it actually a dress? Was it a, a skirt and a blouse? Mm. Um, was it, were they wearing pants? Were they wearing boots? Were they barefoot? Mm. Like, were they upper class, lower class? You know, was the was it a nice dress that looked like it was expensive, or was it raggedy and, and you know worn or dirty? And these are all questions they can't answer. Yet, in the beginning of the story, they tell me that they absolutely know what they saw. Yeah, and they prove to themselves that they didn't. When they can't give me any details. So, um, oh, because then this makes me wonder, if you're having these conversations with people and you're asking these probing questions, do you, do you ever find that they doubt starts to creep into their mind? Yes. Do you think that doubt grows into something? Not all the time. Uh, I see doubt at the time. It, there... I would say, and I don't have actual numbers, um, but I would say for the most part, you see the doubt in their face. You start asking questions and their eyes start, they're searching all over, trying to think or trying to save face. And I, I don't want to say that in a derogatory manner or, or mean, because I think people truly have experiences. They have something that happened and they're not most of them are not trying to lie to me or, or, you know, make up shit. Sorry. Um, but I think they're searching for like, what, 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 what did I see? And they're realizing, Oh, I really didn't see it that good. I didn't get a good look at it. I don't really remember what I saw. And you see the doubt in their face mm -hmm. and they either, sometimes they say, I don't, I don't remember. I don't, I don't know. Others try to compensate, like, well, you know, it could have been this, but it was dark. I'm not really sure, but it did happen. Sure. And I get it. Like, all right, you, you have doubts, and you can't answer the question. I get it. Sometimes that stuff takes time, too. So you don't know what happens, I suppose, after you leave people? I, not all the time. Sometimes they do come back. Oh. And, like, it, it's really nice when they do come back and stop me and say, hey, you know, like, I thought about what you said. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized I didn't. I didn't see what I thought I saw. Oh, wow. Um, and I've had that. I actually did a podcast. It wasn't mine. I was being interviewed. And somebody, they described being at a party with a bunch of people. And they saw this apparition across the room. And they told a story. And it was very dramatic. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, like, let's explore this. You know, how long did you actually see this apparition? Because they said they tried to get over the, to it. And by the time they got over to that part that person was going. Mm. So it must have been that they disappeared. And I was like, well, how big was this, like, room? Like, are we talking, like, a, a concert hall? Or was it someone's apartment? And it was someone's apartment. Okay. So it wasn't that big of a room. And even if you pack people in there, you you really should be able to get over it in time. Like, how long did you actually see them? And I'm like, well, maybe it was for, like, five or ten seconds. And oh. I was like, all right, so... Was it, like, that crowded that you couldn't reach them? Well, yeah, it was really crowded. Like, so, did you have, like, line of sight the entire time? Because if it's that crowded, there should be people walking in front of you, like, line of sight. Well, yeah, I guess. I guess they were. And then when they really thought about it, after a few minutes, she's like, you know, I, now I really don't think I saw that. Wow. Because they, they start realizing, like, they didn't, all the details that they had going over in their mind over and over again as they told the story over and over again when they really sat and thought about it it wasn't it wasn't the way they remembered it and uh, I thought that was great and mm -hmm. it wasn't like I didn't take that as an opportunity to go aha, yeah. aha gotcha um, no it was like alright so this is good like we talked it out we worked out the details and y you have come to a different conclusion now and I think that's brilliant. It's, it's reasoning together. It, it's, yes. it's basically Socratic questioning, but it, it's um, like um, 
getting people to explore their own reasoning. Like, we can't change someone else's mind. So, like, I can't take my reasoning and, like, download it into your brain. Um, that would be weird. Wouldn't it? Yeah. You wouldn't want it. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. You, um, you wouldn't want to be in here. <laughs> That's probably true. <laughs> but, um, it's dark. <laughs> but but the, the idea of <laughs> reasoning together... Um, yeah. With the goal of getting to a better conclusion, of making it like a, um, it's a, it's a collaboration. Yes. Um, and not, of course, make making fun of people and right. it never works, right? This, so just, this just putting is that out there for anybody who's listening. Both parties working together. It's instead of me being the token skeptic telling you you're wrong. that's not, yeah, you're wrong. That's not what you saw. You you're don't dumb. know this. Oh, I, I. Dumb and stupid are two words that I try not to use ever. I hate those words. Um, they just, they're so bad and they make people feel like crap. Uh -huh. So, and I know I can be totally dumb. <laughs> I, I can totally be dumb sometimes. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to accuse someone else of being either yeah. dumb or stupid when I know I'm just as bad yeah. sometimes. Um, but yeah, working together, uh, I, I don't want to be that person that just tells you you're wrong. And I don't want them to be on the defensive. This is a mystery. And our job, as an, like, I, I'm an investigator. That is my job. For them, it's more of a hobby. But they call themselves investigators. So this is the time. This is what, you know, it's time to put up or shut up. Let's work together. Let's figure this out. And we work out the details. And by doing that, by discussing that, and just giving gentle pushes, like little suggestions here and there, and letting them take the reins, they come to the conclusion themselves. And I think that's the best way to change someone's mind. Totally. Because if I just tell you, mm -hmm. you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna fight me. Uh-huh. You know, and, and if it gets intense, you might walk away thinking I'm an a-hole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm definitely not changing my mind. No, no. Uh it, yeah, so working together much better, and I that's how I get what I call repeat customers. Mm -hmm. People call me back and say, Hey, you know, you helped me a couple of months ago or a couple of years ago. I want to run something by you. What are the things most commonly mistaken for ghosts or paranormal activity? Misperception. <laughs> there's, uh, I mean, there's this, you can go with physical objects like dust particles creating orbs. Um, you can go with smoke, uh, cigarette smoke. Can't tell you how many times I've seen pictures of cigarette smoke and they're like oh nobody was smoking and there's actually an ashtray in the background um, <laughs> <laughs> they get mad when you point that out uh, there's a lot of physical things you can point out um, optical illusions when when people look at, in the distance especially in the woods like there's a lot of pictures people take in the woods of trees and they put the red circle around it going look there's a face here yeah. And it's pareidolia. It's, mm. it's just, it's all the leaves and branches and every, and bits of light coming through. There's nothing there. Mm. Um, but there is a lot of misperception. There's a lot of misidentification because of lack of knowledge. There's a lot of ignor ignorance that goes on. And I say that because there is a lack of information. People are trying to be experts in things that they have little knowledge in. So... Like I, I come across ghost hunters that give expert opinions on photographs, on video, on audio, when they have no training or experience in any of it. And, and especially when it comes to photography. Like I call most people picture takers because that's all they do. They push a button. They point, shoot, that's it. Yeah. Um, when it comes to understanding how film works, developing film, how digital works, how light interacts with the sensor and film, understanding all of that, there's a science there. There's an actual science there. And when you don't understand how it works, you can't give an extra expert opinion. But I do see people doing it anyway. They'll look at a picture and go, oh, yeah, that looks, that, I don't understand that. So let me say it this way. This is better. I'll see uh, ghost hunters will look at a picture, see an anomaly, and say, oh, yeah, you got something there. Okay. That's what they say. What I hear is, I have no clue what that is, but I like ghosts, so that's a ghost. Okay. And and I will say that's probably an accurate interpretation on my end, because when I do question it, when I hear that, 
I do question it. Like, what do you? Why do you think that's a ghost? Well, look at it. It's an anomaly. It's it's something that sticks out. It's not supposed to be there. How'd that light get there? Mm. How'd that streak of light get there? And all of these excuses, but no information. And and they're asking questions that they should know the answer to, if they can give an expert opinion. But since they can't, they don't know what they're talking about. So when I say misperception, they perceive the world through filters that benefit what they do. I hope that makes sense. Well, so um, that's it. Sounds like from the ghost hunter's perspective. But so um, I'm thinking about just most Americans believe in some sort of paranormal activity, right? They believe in mm. ghosts or being able to talk to the dead or something like that. And so for for those people, if somebody says, um, you know, I have this ghostly experience or um, I believe in ghosts because, you know, this this one time something happened. A bank camp. It, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess if you could very briefly talk to someone like that and and Try to educate them on, hmm, I don't even know how to ask this question because I don't want it to sound condescending. Um, I, I, how would you help someone understand the skeptic worldview and the benefit of that worldview as opposed to the, the believer worldview? Does that make sense? So I, I, right away, Scooby-Doo comes to mind. Um, I mean, people my age, we grew up with it. People older than me grew up with it. Uh, and they were the best ghost hunting team ever. Because within a half hour, they solved the mystery. And it was they, never a ghost. Never a ghost. Uh, it was never a ghost, a monster, alien, it was nothing. A dude in the mask. It was old man <laughs> Withers down at the farm. Um, and and it, it's great because that, that taught you critical thinking. If you paid attention, it, it's, they asked questions. They didn't believe it right away. I mean, well, yeah, Shaggy and Scooby, yeah, they believed it right away. Um, but the others were like, I don't know what's going on. And that's the perfect response. I don't know what's going on. Let's find out. Mm. And so I see the skeptical approach as I don't know what that is. I'm not going to assume it's this or that. I don't know what it is. But I'm going to find out. I have doubts. That's that's basically, I mean, you can sum it up saying, I have doubts. Uh, because you're making a claim, and usually it's an extraordinary claim. I have doubts that your claim is true. Mm. I'm not saying it's not true, but I have doubts. And I want to find out more about it. So this is my personal perspective of this. This is my take on skepticism, is that I have doubts, so that I'm, gonna, I'm going to investigate that mystery, that, that claim. I'm going to see if that person really existed. I'm going to see if um, somebody actually died in that house. I'm going to see if uh, what the weather was like when you saw that alien spaceship land in your backyard. Um, I want to know all this information. And in the end, a good investigation will give you, it will provide so much information that you can paint this picture. You can write the story with facts uh, and documentation and you can solve that mystery. You can come to the best conclusion. Sometimes you can solve it 100%. Sometimes you're like 90. But I have documents and, and all this data to back this up that the best possible conclusion based on the data says this. And when that happens, you, you solve a mystery. Mm. You, you solve it. You can say, look, I'm, I'm pretty sure I know what this is. And this is it. And this is what led me to this. Instead of... I sat in a, in a haunted house all night in the dark, and I talked to the dark, and I got this growling noise on a recorder. That's proof. And, and it, yeah, there's a little mockery in there, and I apologize, but that's, that's basically what I, I see. And I, I look at that and say, well, there's so much more. I'm hearing you say empowering. Like, the skeptical approach and the... I don't know, let's find out. And solving the mystery is, it's empowering to be able to know what's real, to figure it out. To figure it out. Yeah. You, you F around and find out. <laughs> That's what you do. And it, 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 it expands your knowledge base. You learn more. And I mean, that's my motto is never stop learning. And to actually investigate something, 
you go down avenues of, of, of education that you might never go down if you hadn't heard a story of this ghost or that ghost. So I love the idea of ghost stories and investigating them, but you actually have to investigate them. Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, that knowledge empowers me where... Like we we looked at pictures today, mm. we had the tour. That of this was place. cool to hear you break down those pictures. It was so much fun, and I, I didn't know it. that about photos. Like I didn't know. Like you looked at the one, and it's like that's just a black and white version of a, a thermal th camera. Thermal. Yeah, I wouldn't have known that. And, and you're and like, oh yeah, it's just a light. <laughs> <laughs> that was per that was great one. That 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 picture. Because there was a there was a photograph for everyone watching. There was a photograph for that right where of, we sit of here. Yeah, and there was an anomaly. Right here. Well, it looked like a head. <laughs> yeah. You were a That's, pareidolia. Yeah. It was claimed it was a head. But when you compared it, and we actually, we stood up, and we had the, the photo in front of us, and we looked, and we matched everything up, and it was like, that's the lamp. And yeah. and the the nice nice lady yeah. that was telling us, she looked at it, and was just like, oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, and, and that was it. There and was, then she said... I learned something. Yes. That and was great. That is, that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> that's the point of everything that I do to help people, to help educate people, to, to give them that knowledge, to give them the tools, actually, to give them the tools to find this knowledge on their own mm -hmm. and to help them do better, to improve the quality of their work. Yes. So. Well, my model is thinking is power because of that. Like and that's a damn good website. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, I didn't mean to plug my website. That was not my part. But like it's the thinking sure. is power. Wink, 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 wink. <laughs> Let's wrap up here. But I, I, I want you to, um, like, talking to. Um, I'm imagining now my ten year old niece, who um, is a, a child with childlike wonder, right? Um, and I always come back to Darwin. You know, there's grandeur in this view of life. So I like to think that there's still like beauty in seeing the world okay. as it is. But, but um, a, a child who's still in that age though, where um, curiosity and um, wonder are sort of combined together in this beautiful little package of, um, let's get to that age. What would you say to someone that age to get them um, to think about the world as you see it. First, sit them down in front of Scooby-Doo. Mm. Just watch those. Watch the older episodes. Just go through it. And then get them outside. Like, like when we got here today and we went through the woods, the haunted woods, mm. I had fun listening to you educate me on the trees and how... Why, why they grew the way they, they grew and some of the plants that were out there and telling me about that because I didn't know any of that. And I, I think what really captivates me is the enthusiasm. Don't be boring about it. Mm. Science can be fun. Investigating for real can be fun. It's, it's really interesting when you, you discover a new clue. And like for history... I love digging into people's lives because you start painting a picture of someone that lived two, three hundred years ago and you see the world through their eyes and you get a different perspective. It's, it's fabulous. That might be something that comes with age. I don't know. But outside, seeing your enthusiasm and, and like excitement about, oh, look at this, look at that. Oh, this is a border because of this. And it might be a tree that fell down. And I dug down and found the tree. And you were finding things and you were getting your hands dirty. That's, that's a good thing. You can get your hands dirty. You don't have to sit on a couch, on your phone all day and just talk to your friends. Get outside, get dirty, and, and play with dirt. <laughs> play with nature. That's, that's a start. Yeah. That's one way. Um, another way is, like, I, I had taken my son a few times when I went out to investigate some claims. Awesome. When he was young. And we would talk about it. And I would tell him, like, hey, you know, like, in this room, these bedroom doors, they, they open and close by themselves. You know, what? let's look. And we would go up and see, the, like, the doors slowly move open. Like, what do you think is causing that? Let's, let's look around. And... He would point out things like, oh, and like at one place we saw like one window was covered with a trash bag and you could see the trash bag going in and out. Mm. And I was like, what do you think of that? He's like, well, that's going in and out. And he's like, wait a minute. And he would look at the door and look at that and you're like, 
they're moving at the same time. And I'm like, yeah, why do you think? He's like, I don't really know. I'm like, all right, this is good. Let's, let's look it up. And we looked up uh, uh, air pressure and how it comes in. And it doesn't just blow. Like, you can't just put a, a little box fan on a, fit, on a door and expect it to close because that's not how the air pressure in the house works. When air comes in from the outside, all the air moves. So air is affecting the entire surface of that door when the wind blows outside and comes inside the, the house. And all that air from that leak comes in and pushes all the air that's in that room. And all that air on the room is pushing gently on that door, the entire surface of the door, not just a little bit of it. And it closes it. And then when the wind blows a different way and sucks out air, comes out and it was just so much fun and to see his eyes like oh wow this is cool and he would run around the different rooms and say look this window's open there's a whole way out to this outside here and we learned together what was going on and he was so excited he was having fun figuring it out yes that's awesome. yeah because it was a little challenge and he wasn't alone i was mm -hmm. helping him so we had help we could ask questions and we could get answers and that was exciting to both of us. I was excited. I was like, we're, we're figuring out a mystery. This is great. <laughs> Father and son kind of thing. This is awesome. Um, That's amazing. And honestly, like, um, the difference in the message between that and must be a ghost. Yeah. Stop. Right. Right. Wow. Like, the, the lesson that you taught him in teaching him how to, how to figure out a message, uh, figure out a mystery, um, as opposed to when these supernatural explanations just sort of stop questioning. Yeah. Um, and, oh, yeah. I they don't have kids, you, so I just think that's fabulous. They give you an answer. The supernatural way gives you an answer without a reason. You don't show your work, mm. basically. And that's how I was raised. And I'm sure we were raised that way, too. You showed your work. You did a math problem. You couldn't just put the answer. No, no, no. You got in trouble for that. Mm -hmm. You had to show your work. And I, I think we should all do that. If you come to a conclusion that what you experienced was a, a ghost or a demon or a UFO or whatever, you need to show your work all the way up to that point. And if you can't, something's wrong. You need to go back to the beginning and start again. You ever seen that comic where it's the like physicist and he's at his chalkboard and he's got like all this complex math? And between this part and this part, it says, then a miracle occurs. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah. you, know, you can't do that. No, no, no. <laughs> tap, tap, delete. <laughs> Go on. Uh, <sighs> well, anyway, this has been really interesting. Thank you so I much so. for this, I this conversation. So. I hope people are watching going, this guy's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be the first well, you time. You know what? <laughs> Cheers. Thank Cheers. you so much. You're welcome. Hmm. Mm -mm. Let's go find some ghosts. Let's go find some ghosts. <laughs> Show me a ghost. Ghosties. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for watching. Did we see a ghost? Watch the next video to find out.